Captain's Log, star date. Um, uh, Tuesday. We have just received orders from Starfleet regarding our next mission. It is a simple enough task. However, it could prove to be quite dangerous. We must review a film from one of the most beloved and influential franchises in history, which could risk drawing the ire of thousands of the most feared creatures in all the galaxy. Fanboys. Nevertheless, we will press on. We must press on. Besides, we really have nothing better to do. This is Cinematic Excrement, and it's high time we took a look at Star Trek The Motion Picture. This is the film that launched an incredibly long-running and lucrative film franchise that is still active today, with another movie due out in 2016. Quite remarkable considering the movie that started it all by all rights never should have been made in the first place. Star Trek, of course, began life as a television series in 1966. It's the 23rd century and the crew of the Starship Enterprise have embarked on a five-year mission to explore strange new worlds, to seek out intelligent life, to boldly go, well, you know the drill. Unfortunately, we never got to see the end of that five-year mission as the series was canceled after three seasons due to declining ratings. And if you've seen any episodes from season three, you'll understand why. And if you haven't, feel free to check out my review of Spock's brain for a little sample of what viewers were treated to during that last season. It was not pretty. The series probably should have been forgotten after its cancellation, but somehow it found new life in syndication and maintained a cult following throughout the 1970s. This led Paramount executives to believe there was still life in the franchise, and they offered creator Gene Roddenberry the opportunity to turn his beloved TV series into a motion picture. This began a long back and forth between Roddenberry and Paramount. After being given the go-ahead to make the movie, Roddenberry turned in a script which he called The God Thing which was rejected by the studio. Then Paramount decided to scrap the movie entirely and instead opted to make a new Star Trek TV series. Stories were solicited from several prominent writers, all of which were rejected by the studio. Then Paramount said, you know what? We're gonna go back to the idea of making a movie, which was now going to be called Star Trek Planet of the Titans. This time they did approve the story. However, several revisions of the script were, you guessed it, rejected and the project was shelved. Then plans changed yet again, and this time the change was a pretty big deal. Paramount announced they were launching their own television network with a new Star Trek TV series, which would now be called Star Trek Phase 2, as the new network's flagship program. The show would tell the story of a new five-year mission for the Enterprise, with most of the original cast returning. Though to everyone's dismay, there would be no more Spock as Leonard Nimoy opted out. But they pressed on without Nimoy, and by August of 1977, pre-production was underway for Phase 2. Sets were built, costumes were designed, the script for the pilot episode, In Thy Image, was written, everything was ready to go. Until Paramount decided the new network wasn't worth the cost and pulled the plug. And that probably would have been the death knell for Star Trek. But later that year, something wonderful happened. Yep, in 1977, Star Wars hit the big screen and made far more money than anyone expected. And this got Paramount executives thinking, wow, people really like their sci-fi right now. If only we had a way to exploit this. If only we had the rights to a sci-fi property that we could turn into a movie. Oh wait, we do! And so the studio began production on a Star Trek motion picture based on the script for what would have been the pilot episode for Phase 2, In Thy Image. So what started out as a movie, then became a TV series, which then became a movie again, which then became a TV series again, and ultimately ended up as a movie. Everybody got that? Good! So after all that mess, plus a production that went behind schedule and over budget and barely made its release date, Star Trek The Motion Picture hit the big screen in 1979. Let's see what it has to offer.
Our story begins in space. Because it's Star Trek, duh. And in space, we see what appears to be a giant glowing cloud. All hail the mighty glow cloud. The cloud is approached by a trio of Klingon battlecruisers piloted by creatures that look absolutely nothing like the Klingons from the TV series. How they suddenly develop the ridges on their foreheads is not explained. Maybe it's some kind of 23rd century body modification trend? Attention all nerds. Don't even think about it. Oh, don't act so innocent. You know exactly what you were about to do. You were about to post an annoying nitpicky comment describing in excruciating detail why the Klingons have ridged foreheads in the movie even though they didn't in the TV series. But here's the thing. We here at Cinematic Excrement, and by we, I really mean me. This is pretty much a solo project, so I guess I'm using, like, the royal we or something? Anyway, we here at Cinematic Excrement do not care. You're not telling us anything we don't already know or can't easily look up ourselves. We have access to the same internet as you, that's kinda how we uploaded this video in the first place, duh, and we are well aware that there is an official canon explanation for the different varieties of Klingon foreheads. The point is, in 1979, when the movie was released, this explanation did not exist. The only explanation was Roddenberry thought it looked cool, and this likely would have been quite confusing to people who saw the movie. That's the point we're trying to make here. So let it go. For the love of God, let it go. We now return you to your regularly scheduled review, already in progress. Naturally, when the Klingons are presented with something they don't understand, their first instinct is to shoot at it. It doesn't go well. Before they get vaporized, the Klingons manage to transmit a warning that the glow cloud All hail is headed for Earth. The warning is relayed to Starfleet HQ and ultimately to Admiral James T. Kirk, played by William Shatner. For reasons that are beyond me, Admiral Kirk doesn't trust anyone else to handle this mission and uses his influence to regain control of the Enterprise so he can lead the mission to intercept the glow cloud All hail. and stop it from doing unspeakable harm to the Earth. And, of course, the Enterprise is the only ship that's close enough to intercept whatever it is that's headed toward Earth. How is that even possible? You would think Starfleet would have more than one ship near its own headquarters at any given time. It is called Starfleet, right? And for that matter, why does Kirk have to be so insistent that he lead the mission? I give him points for bravery, but methinks the man is starting to believe his own hype. Since the transporters on the Enterprise are currently busted, the only ship that can save the day, and it ain't even working properly. Scotty has to take Kirk on board via shuttlecraft. And this is the point where the movie grinds to a halt, as for some reason, the director felt the need to show the audience every square millimeter of the exterior of the goddamn Enterprise. And don't get me wrong, it looks amazing. The model work and the cinematography are all very impressive, but nothing is actually happening. And this goes on for almost five minutes. Yeah, five minutes of just flying by the ship. There isn't even any dialogue. Look, Star Trek, I get it. For the first time ever, you actually have a budget and you really want to show it off. Believe me, I'm happy for you. I really am. But could you show it off just a little bit faster? You're putting the audience to sleep here. I can see my house from here. When they finally get on board the damn ship, Kirk says hi to his old friends who are quite pleased to see him. There's really nothing special about this scene in the theatrical cut. In the director's cut, however, there's an interesting line of dialogue from Lieutenant Uhura after one of the newer crew members acts a bit skeptical of Kirk taking over. The possibilities of our returning from this mission in one piece may have just doubled. Oh, you say that now. Then Kirk pays a visit to the current Enterprise captain, Decker, played by... Stephen Collins. Ooh... Dear, um, um, uh, no, 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 you know what, there is no way I can make any joke that will not be super awkward here, so let's just say fuck that guy and let's move on. 
Kirk breaks the news to Decker that he's taking command of the Enterprise and Decker has temporarily been demoted to commander. Again, I must ask why this is necessary. Kirk may have an experience advantage over Decker, but I don't really see how that experience will help him against a giant space cloud of death that effortlessly zaps anything in its way into nothingness. Also, as Decker points out, the Enterprise has undergone a significant renovation and is almost a completely different ship. At this point, Decker knows her better than Kirk. So what sense does it make for Kirk to take over? If he wants to help, fantastic. But why can't he simply tag along in an advisory position? I'm sorry, Will. No, I don't know. I don't think you're sorry. Not one damn bit. I agree. Kirk is clearly putting his ego in the way of good judgment. Fuck him. But Decker is played by Stephen Collins, so fuck him too. Can we just put Sulu in charge or something? And sure enough, it doesn't take long for something to go horribly wrong. They try to beam two more crew members aboard after fixing the transporters, but they suddenly break down again, and what happens is pretty disturbing. Enterprise, what we got back didn't live long, fortunately. Well, Kirk is certainly off to a great start, isn't he? They already have two casualties and they haven't even left the damn dry dock yet. Sure, it technically wasn't his fault, but still, can't be a good sign. The possibilities of our returning from this mission in one piece may have just doubled. Well, two times zero is still zero. After they get the transporter fixed, for real this time, we're introduced to the ship's new navigator, Lieutenant Ilea, played by Persis Kambata. Ilea is a member of a nearly hairless humanoid race from the planet Delta. My oath of celibacy is on record, Captain. Okay. Good to know? Ugh. Attention all nerds. You were about to do it again, weren't you? We told you to knock that shit off. We're well aware of the actual reason for Ilea taking an oath of celibacy. We looked it up. And anyone else could easily do the same, either by reading the Memory Alpha wiki or the novelization of the movie, which actually explains why it's necessary for a Delton to be celibate while serving in Starfleet. The point is, they shouldn't have to. It should not be necessary to read supplemental material to understand what's going on in the movie. The movie should be able to stand on its own. But in both the theatrical and director's cuts, Ilea mentions her oath of celibacy with no explanation as if everyone should automatically understand what that means. And to the casual viewer, it's very confusing. So calm your tits. We now return you to your regularly scheduled... whatever. In addition to Ilea, we're also treated to the return of a familiar face in the form of Dr. Mc... <laughs> Holy Saturday Night Fever, Batman! What is this? Did they literally just drag DeForest Kelly off the street and throw him onto the set? Or was there some sort of disco revival in the 23rd century? Damn it, Bones. I need you. Badly. You heard him, Doctor. He needs Bones. Badly. So now that the crew is on board, the ship can finally pull out of the dry dock, which of course results in another two minutes of nothing happening. And then, because even Kirk is getting bored of this shit, he orders the Enterprise to go to warp speed. Decker and Scotty both point out that the new engines haven't been properly tested yet, but Kirk says, testing be damned, we need warp speed now. What could possibly go wrong? Emergency alert. Emergency alert. Emergency alert. Wormhole. Oh, that's right, everything! The Enterprise gets caught in a wormhole, and they find themselves in a collision course with an asteroid. Kirk orders Chekhov to blast it with the phasers. No! Delay that phaser order! This movie just turned into an acid trip. But I guess I shouldn't be surprised. It was made in the 70s. Whoa. Overriding the captain, Decker has Chekhov blast the asteroid with a photon torpedo, which saves the day. You'd think Kirk would be happy about this, but no. He drags Decker into his quarters and demands an explanation. Sir, the Enterprise redesign increases phaser power by channeling it through the main engines. When they went into antimatter imbalance, the phasers were automatically cut off. Which means if they had followed Kirk's order, they would all be dead. But that wouldn't have mattered had they not gone to warp speed before the engines were properly tested. 
the possibilities of our returning from this mission in one piece may have just doubled. Did the people who wrote this script really hate Captain Kirk and or William Shatner? Because they seem to be going out of their way to make him look like an idiot. Fortunately, someone arrives who actually does have half a brain. Why, it's Mr. Spock. Spock! I love that. Yep, the pointy-eared science officer we all know and love has finally graced us with his presence, and in a matter of minutes, he has solved their engine problem and the engines are working at warp speed. Sadly, the movie is still moving under impulse power. Spock's late arrival is actually rather fitting, as Leonard Nimoy originally refused to do the film, as he was still in the midst of a dispute with Paramount over royalty payments and had also grown tired of the character. Spock wasn't even in the original version of the script. But eventually, director Robert Wise and producer Jeffrey Katzenberg reached an agreement with Nimoy that not only paid him his lost royalties, but gave him some creative control over the final script. This was enough to convince Nimoy to don the pointy ears once again. Spock's role in the movie reflects what happened with Nimoy in a way, as he begins not on the Enterprise, but on his home planet of Vulcan, ready to leave Starfleet and all of his human emotions behind and fully commit himself to Vulcan society. But he suddenly senses a disturbance in the Force, or some such bullshit, and returns to action. But when he arrives, he at first seems unusually distant from his former shipmates, clearly still conflicted over returning to the life he was ready to give up. Personally, I like what they did with Spock in this movie. Not only is it a reflection of real life, but it adds an interesting element to the character. Which is more than I can say for the rest of the original cast. Apart from Spock and Kirk to a lesser extent, there's really not a whole lot to say about the returning characters. The movie clearly put visuals above all else and characterization took a back seat, so they're pretty much just going through the motions. And again, the visuals look fantastic, but the characters are what made Star Trek great in the first place. Anyway, now that the engines are working, they finally caught up with the glow cloud. All hail. And thanks to some help from Spock, who seems to have some kind of telepathic link to whatever is in the cloud, they manage to convince it they mean no harm, and it invites them in. And in they go. And if you thought the sequence of Kirk taking the shuttlecraft to the Enterprise was ridiculously long, that was nothing. The scene of the Enterprise flying into the cloud is even longer. This sequence lasts for, I shit you not, 10 minutes. 10 minutes of flying alongside the alien ship at about half the speed of smell, while they keep cutting back and forth between shots of the ship and shots of the Enterprise crew looking dumbfounded. What little dialogue there is basically amounts to, holy shit, that thing is huge. Again, it all looks fantastic, but it's fantastically boring. I'm starting to see why some people refer to this as Star Trek The Motionless Picture. Eventually, they find a way into the alien vessel, but they don't get far before they're cut off by... a giant alien sphincter. And I'm not just saying that because I'm incredibly immature. I'm saying the next thing I'm about to say because I'm incredibly immature. I believe the closed orifice leads to another chamber. <laughs> he said orifice. I suspect it may be necessary. Line. Suddenly, the alien ship sends some kind of probe that scoops up Lieutenant Ilea. For some reason. But a few minutes later, Ilea is returned in the form of a robot. Wearing a skimpy outfit. But to be fair, it's no less ridiculous than what she was wearing before. Yeah, can we talk about these new uniforms? Because they are hideous. I suppose for the ladies, they're a slight step up from the ridiculous miniskirts they wore in the TV series. But now it looks like they're all wearing pajamas. Reportedly, the cast hated them too. In fact, some of them refused to sign on for the sequel unless the uniforms were changed. Which they were, and everyone was better off for it. Anyway, the Ilea bot says she was programmed to observe the carbon units on the Enterprise by someone or something called V'ger, who is headed to Earth to find and join with what it calls the Creator. Kirk and Spock try to get some information out of her, but this proves to be an exercise in futility. And who is the Creator? The Creator is that which created V'ger. Who is V'ger? V'ger is that which seeks the Creator. Brain and brain, what is brain? Surprisingly, Ilea Bot seems to recognize Commander Decker, leading Spock to suspect the probe contains Ilea's memory patterns as well as her physical form. 
They asked Decker to give Ilea Bot the 50 cent tour of the Enterprise since he and Ilea had a thing at one time and their past relationship may help him to get some information out of the probe. Meanwhile, Spock sneaks out of the Enterprise with a spacesuit and manages to enter the alien ship. I have successfully penetrated the next chamber of the alien's interior. You heard him. He just penetrated the orifice. And we get yet another slow traveling sequence, but at least this one is fairly short and actually has a point. Spock sees various images of planets that V'ger has apparently seen on its journeys, along with a... giant space vagina. I'm not the only one seeing this, right? I mean, that's clearly a freaking vagina. First the sphincter, and now the vagina. Are they doing this on purpose, or is it just my dirty mind? Inside the space vagina, Spock finds a copy of the Ilea probe. He tries to mind meld with it and gets knocked unconscious for his trouble. When he comes to, he informs Kirk and Bones what he's learned. V'ger is not a biological life form. It is actually a living machine. And now that they've finally reached Earth, V'ger is attempting to signal its creator. Unfortunately, it gets no response, so it decides to take the next logical step. Blow everything up. Whoa, V'ger, is this really necessary? Maybe the creator is just out to lunch, wait an hour and call back, jeez. After consulting with his officers, Kirk tells Ileabot that he knows why the creator hasn't responded, but he will only reveal the information to V'ger in person, and only if V'ger promises not to blow up the planet. He's lying, of course, but V'ger buys it and allows the Enterprise to enter its orifice. And I promise that's the last time we're going to talk about the orifice. Once they arrive at the center of the alien ship, which for some reason has a breathable atmosphere, how goddamn convenient, they finally learn the truth. V'ger is actually short for Voyager 6, a probe that was originally launched from Earth many years ago. Somehow it ended up on an alien world populated by living machines who gave it a considerable upgrade and allowed it to complete its mission, gather as much data as possible, and return to its creator. And some of you are probably thinking, gee, that sounds awfully familiar. Well, that's probably because you saw the TV episode where they did almost the exact same thing. This is not the first time the Enterprise has come in contact with a lost probe from Earth. They first encountered such a probe, which was called Nomad, in the original series episode, The Changeling. The encounter with the Nomad Pro played out a bit differently than the encounter with V'ger in the film, but the basic premise for both stories is about the same. Your first big motion picture, and it's a glorified remake of a story you've already told. That's kinda lazy. It's also why some refer to this movie as Star Trek, where Nomad has gone before. Anyway, now that V'ger, or Voyager, has returned to Earth, it must join with the creator in order to evolve. Obviously, whoever created the probe is long dead, so another carbon unit will have to fill the role. And Decker jumps at the chance. Decker, don't. Jim, I want this. As much as you wanted the Enterprise, I want this. Plus, I'm pretty sure this means I'll be able to make sweet love to the Delton chick for the rest of eternity, so I'm not really seeing a downside here. And so Decker joins with V'ger and forms a star child or something, I don't know, and the Earth is saved and the Enterprise is free to fly off on its next mission, whatever that may be. And that was Star Trek The Motion Picture, a slow plotting mess. And I wonder if the story's origins may have something to do with it. Remember, the script for this movie was based on what would have been the pilot episode for Star Trek Phase Two. Now, the pilot was going to be two hours long, but once you factor out commercial breaks, that's only about an hour and a half. The movie, however, was 2 hours and 12 minutes. And it seems to me they stretched out the running time by adding... Well, a lot of pretty pictures and not much else. On top of that, you have a lack of character development, an insufferable Captain Kirk, and a story that's not terribly exciting and has basically already been told. The end result is a movie that does not do the beloved franchise justice. But it's not all bad. The visuals are extremely well done, especially for the 1970s. Jerry Goldsmith's score was great, and the main theme would later be recycled for Star Trek The Next Generation. There were a few funny lines here and there, and while William Shatner is still William Shatner, the acting overall was pretty good. 
even though the cast didn't often have much to do apart from staring at visual effects that hadn't been completed yet when their scenes were filmed. Stephen Collins and Persis Kambata in particular were excellent and had very good chemistry. It's a pity the characters didn't survive beyond the end of the film. But despite the movie's good points, in the end it's just too long, too slow, and too boring. Now, as I alluded to earlier, there is a director's cut of the film that was released in 2001, and it is definitely an improvement over the theatrical cut. Some deleted footage was added back into the film, and several scenes were re-edited to improve the pacing. The pacing is still not great, but they did as well as they could given what they had to work with. They also added some new computer-generated effects and took great care to make the new effects look as if they could have been part of the original film. Take that, George Lucas! Sadly, if you want to watch the director's edition, you're limited to DVD as it's not available on Blu-ray and probably won't be anytime soon. When they added the new effects to the director's cut, they rendered them in 480p, which was fine for DVD but would look out of place in high definition. So if they were to do a Blu-ray release, they would have to go back and redo all of the new effects. Ironic that people working on a Star Trek movie would not give enough consideration for the future. In any case, Star Trek The Motion Picture, even with the director's cut, is not a very good film for fans of the franchise or the casual viewer. Nevertheless, it made enough money for Paramount to consider a sequel, albeit with a lower budget. And so, in 1982, they released Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan. And totally redeemed themselves! Star Trek II is everything the first movie should have been and more. It has a good story, fun interactions between the characters, an intimidating villain, memorable dialogue, uniforms that don't look stupid, enough technobabble to keep the nerds happy, and some great space battles to keep the action fans happy. It's not just a great Star Trek movie, it's one of the best science fiction movies of all time. If you're new to the Star Trek movies, I would actually recommend skipping the first movie entirely and starting with this one you're not missing much. But if you must watch the first movie, I recommend the director's edition if you can find a copy. It's a much better version of the film. And that concludes today's mission. Next month is Halloween, which means we will be taking a look at another scary movie. Until then, I am Captain James T. Jerk, and Hollywood can suck it. Well, two times two is still zero. What? The fuck did I just... <sighs> two times two... Math is hard. Bleh.